Good afternoon, everybody. And it's great to be here. It's great to be here with so many people who have come uh, to celebrate their appreciation and their love and gratitude to the Lord himself for his great love and mercy to us. And uh, like I always say to our groups when we sit down for therapy in Coenvera, that's, um, you know, next to the love that the Lord has for us, the greatest power that is here today after the Lord's love is the love that we have for one another, the love that we share. And I suppose nowadays that we're so much into discovering more and more about the various energies that are moving so many things around the world, like uh, the mobile phone, you can pick it up and because of some energies that are between it and some other mobile phone, probably in Australia, you can talk to somebody or you can send a text message. So you can imagine the healing power of the energy of all the love that is gathered here together today and the effects that our coming together will have on the whole world. Uh, the power of our love, I think, is the greatest power of all. Um, that is good because it's not so much important what we say to one another, it's the love that we share and the love that we have. And um, when Father Carl suggested to me the night he was down that I, that I might say two words here today, my first thought was, well, what use would I be up there? And my second thought was, how can I refuse? How can I refuse the Lord who has shown so much love and mercy to me and to all my friends for so long, for a whole lifetime? So that's how I happen to be here. Um, like Father Pat Martin, I had very good parents and that was, I suppose, the first way that I experienced the great mercy and the great love of our Lord. Um, my mother was a very loving woman and um, she was very devoted to the Mass. I remember that Sunday morning Mass was the highlight of our week at home. My mother would be up about six o'clock in the morning milking cows and doing all the other chores around the farm in order to be ready for half past seven to go to Mass in the Pony and Trap Rosna. And um, she went rain, hair or shine and we all went with her. And uh, I can always remember the reverence and the respect and the love and how we always waited for that moment of consecration. No doubt she was totally convinced that it was a repetition of the sacrifice in Calvary. And um, strangely enough, when I first was acquainted with Sister Faustina and the prayer for the chaplet, that was the card that struck home to me, was the prayer was exactly the prayer that explains the Mass to us in our catechism in school, that it was the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that that is what was being taught, what Sister Faustina was being told about. And um, I know that that love of the Mass and the power of the Mass has been a great strength in my life. Also, of course, I couldn't um, talk about the Lord himself without bringing in his mother. Because if anyone ever had a friend I have certainly experienced and known what it is to have Our Lady as a friend. She has been a friend to me like no one else ever could or would be. I was so pleased to hear the Angelus and the hint Our Lady before I stood up here because it gave me courage and hope. I said I won't be standing up alone because I wouldn't be much use here if I was standing up alone. My mother was very devoted to the rosary and the family rosary was very, very nice. Of 
course she set her own novena rosaries privately and um, I suppose maybe it would have been better for me to do my lessons at night when I came home from school but instead of doing that I said the rosary going to school in the mornings because I always felt that I said the rosary going down the fields that somehow or another I'd get through my lessons and later on when I went to secondary school I always made sure to get to Mass in the morning to pull me through the day. Um, I think that there is no better way that the Lord or no greater way the Lord could ever show his love for us than to be present in our tabernacles and to be present in the Eucharist. To think that we can actually meet the Lord face to face every day and that he has the humility and that great love to come to us. Where would we be without him? A friend of mine told me this story some time ago. Um, he said that he, a friend of his was in this is in the convent in Beaumont here in Dublin and he came across two elderly sisters and they were sitting in a room praying and he stopped for a moment and he said to them how necessary their prayers were today especially the way things were going in so many areas in the city and after a while one of the sisters said people have forgotten about the mystical Christ He said he was so impressed by what she said because he felt that she had summed up what has actually happened in our country. And living in Coenbera, particularly at this time, when I work in the unit with people who are addicted to drugs, and when I see the devastation, the heartbreak, the misery, the pain, and the anguish that is caused by drug addiction and addiction to alcohol, I am convinced that there was a lot in what that man said. It's unbelievable. And Gerard in his talk explained to us what he suffered as a result of alcoholism. Well, day after day, night after night, I see the ravages and the pain and the stress and the worry. Because people today are searching for something they're searching for God, but they're all searching in the wrong places. They're like the man who lost his car keys, and he went looking for them under the lamppost. So his friend came along and he said, Pat, are you looking for something? Oh, I am, he said, I lost my car keys. So Jack looked around with him for a while, for three or four minutes, and he said, They're not here, Pat. Where did you lose them? And Pat said, I lost them, he said, two or three hundred yards up the road. And he said, why are you looking for them here? Oh, he said, there's more light here. <laughs> so today, I'm afraid we're looking in the bright lights for what we're not going to find there. Because the void that is in people's lives can only be filled by the love of God. And St. Augustine found that out many, many years ago when he said, after trying it all out, he did too, wine, women, and song in his own time. But he said when he eventually found God, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are ever restless until we find our rest in you. And that surely describes the lives of all of us who are addicted in any way. And I suppose most of us are addicted in some way. Addictions are as varied and as numerous as the people are. I was a bit surprised myself. We have an oratory in the drug unit, a little oratory, and I invited the lads who are there doing the program to visit the Blessed Sacrament. Now they're all in their late teens, early twenties. 
And they said, maybe, sister, you would explain to us what does that mean. They had no idea. And on Sunday, when I said I was going over for the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, they said, can you tell us what that's about? Likewise, about the Mass. They had no understanding that at Mass we have the sacrifice of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ offered on our altars. But the good thing is that the joy they, the joy that came to them and the heart they took from knowing that the Lord is in the house. Down through the years in our houses, indeed in the Thai and in Brewery, we had a big struggle before we got permission to have the Blessed Sacrament. And I can remember many nights in the Thai in the early days, and in those days people came from all over Ireland. Many people came from the city of Dublin here. And many of them, not alone were they suffering from addiction, but they were very disturbed, very troubled. And in the early days, I often found myself there on my own, more or less. But when we got the Blessed Sacrament in the house, I never felt alone again. And every night, I made sure before I went to bed, at whatever time in the morning I was going to bed, that I left the chapel door open and the light on. Not that the Lord needed the light on or the chapel door open, but we needed to know that we had somebody else looking after us. They certainly needed to know that there was someone else around besides me. I remember a nurse came and he came to do a night duty and after about two months, one morning before I got out of bed, he actually came into my room because he said, for so hard to check me down during the day. Then he nailed me while I couldn't stay in the bed. So he said, there's something I want to say to you. He said, when I came here and was going on my duty, you said to me to do the best I could, but not to be worried because Our Lady would look after us. He said, I've been here for the past two months and I've worked in hospitals where they had all kinds of security and all kinds of precautions and all kinds of staff and they didn't have half the problems that we have here. But he said, lots of tragedies and things happened in them places. But he said, I'm more convinced than you are this morning that there definitely is somebody else looking after us. And of course there was. The Lord himself and his mother have guarded us in Coenvera and have protected us like no one else ever would or could. And today, today in our houses there are 450 to 500 people suffering from addictions various kinds. And all of them are being helped, and all of them are discovering the beauty, the goodness, the giftedness. They're all discovering their own uniqueness, and all discovering what it is like to be made in the image and likeness of God himself. They're all fed and housed and looked after, and definitely it's not by me, it has to be by the Lord and his mother. So we have every reason to be grateful. We have every reason to talk about the divine mercy. We have every reason to be happy that we are not on our own. All of these people have done so much for me by their love and their support. Queen Vera is run as a family and all of us are members of that family. I can remember one night, long time ago, one man was very, very disturbed. He was so disturbed that the other people in the house said, well, they couldn't go to sleep, or they couldn't go to bed if I kept him. I knew he had no place to go. 
So I said, well, you can go to bed, I'll stay up, and I'll mind Tom. And one of the lads decided to stay up with me. So after about an hour or so, when all the others were asleep, Eddie, who had stayed up with us, said, we'll go down to my room, he said, and sit down. So the three of us went down, and we sat on the bed. And Tom, who was very disturbed, was talking non-stop. And Eddie was listening to him. So was I for a while. But I was very tired because I hadn't been in bed the night before. And I decided I'd lie down in the bed and let them talk away. So I closed my eyes. And I had them only closed a few minutes when they observed that I wasn't saying anything. And they said to one another, she's gone to sleep. So after a few minutes, one of them said, we'll go up, we'll leave her there, we'll go up to the kitchen. So Eddie went out the door first, and then Tom stood up. And he turned on the light, turned off the light, went outside the door, and I heard him talking to himself. He came back in, turned on the light, and I was peeping out from under my eyelids. And he said, he said, I'd better stay, he said, with our sister in case some maniac comes the way. <laughs> he took off his overcoat and he placed it over me on the bed. And he lay down on the floor. I fell asleep. And when I woke at seven o'clock in the morning, he was still asleep on the floor with nothing over him, and I on the bed with his overcoat. <laughs> Coomber is there for anybody who wants it. Coomber is there for all of us. It's in trust for all those who need it. Today, more than ever, I'm sure, there are a lot of people who need Coonvera. And I would be saying to any of you out there, who may, like Jared, have suffered at the hands of drug abuse or alcohol, that the people who suffer from this addiction suffer a lot because of the anguish and the pain they cause, and that their hearts are very often breaking because they know they cannot be forgiven or they will not be forgiven by the people whom they hurt. I think that is their greatest and biggest suffering. And unfortunately, they seem to have the happiness of suffering from tremendous guilt and remorse. Their big problem, as I see it, is their inability to love themselves. And somehow, from their childhoods, they have seemed to have brought with them the idea they are not as good as anybody else. That there is something lacking for them. They would rather be in someone else's shoes. And one of the best lessons that I learned in the very early days was from a woman whose husband had a very bad drinking problem. And they owned a pub in a little town down the country. He used to get very, very sick. She had two young children at the time, and she had to look after the bar. And her husband was upstairs calling her name. He used to say, Mary, Mary, Mary. And she'd be up and down the stairs saying, what can I do for your love? And it was such an unusual scene for me because I was used to going to houses where there'd be terrible problems and terrible stress and terrible anger. And I said to her one day, Mary, how come you're so patient and so loving with your husband in spite of all you have to do? She too had had a drinking problem. And she said to me, well, when we got married, she said, when I used to be falling over tables and chairs, all he ever said to me was, Mary, you'll be all right one day. And she said, the hope he gave me brought me through. 
and the hope she gave him brought him through, and they have sobered now for many years. Her faith and her trust in him as a result of the faith and trust he had in her. And I know it is very difficult, and I know that unfortunately people drinking alcoholically bring out the worst in all those who care for them. But if you can only have the vision to understand that their worst problem is the hatred, the self-hatred and the dislike they have for themselves and how much in need of a word of encouragement they are from you. For those who suffer from drug addiction, and I'm sure there probably are some mothers here today whose sons or daughters may be suffering from it. They need to belong somewhere, and it's hard to give them that feeling. But their biggest need is a need for self-discipline. You know, the worst thing we can do for our children is to spoil them. The worst thing we can do for them is to give them everything they want. If you can pass on to them a little bit of the faith that brought you here, and a little bit of the love that you have discovered from your own life, from the heart of Jesus, that is what they need. That is what creates the healing in Kundra, the love of the Lord himself and his mother. Thank you.